In this episode, we're talking about Peter F. Drucker's book, The Effective Executive, The Definitive Guide to Getting the Right Things Done. In modern terms, we'd probably call this book being effective AF. This was the last book that I read of 2018, and I read it over the holiday period, sort of November, December there. Got some notes here, got the book here. Really going to dive deep into this. Uh, Peter Drucker is, or I would describe him as the modern day father or grandfather of business thinking, business strategy, sort of a business philosopher. He really was the granddaddy who started it all, all the business books and the, the writing of the books to be effective for CEOs and back in the day when really the main way for people to be successful in life or the, or the parameters was being successful in a, a corporate environment. Obviously, the landscape has changed quite dramatically. Entrepreneurship is now the new sort of CEO ladder climbing champagne career. But the principles in the book are as true today as they were 50 plus years ago when Peter Drucker was teaching them and longer ago when he was actually using them himself because he was not only a author but he was a successful business owner, successful coach and he consulted some of the top CEOs, presidents and others of that ilk throughout his career. Now he quite clearly sets out in the book as a precursor that these skills are learnable, that he never met a natural effective executive. And also the book quite clearly sets out, it's not just for CEOs and corporate ladder climbers. This book is designed to teach you the principles to be the CEO of your own life. It's got five key areas which he discusses in depth in the book, hence why I need my notes today, because I can't talk it all off the top of my head like I usually do. And I want to provide you a little bit of a snippet of each of those five areas. The five areas are time, contribution, strengths, uh, concentration or do the first thing first and the last one is decision. So let's break each of those down very quickly. First of all, let's start with time. Now quite um, sort of quite often people would describe time management as sorting out your time and managing your time. Peter Drucker first of all says this is a stupid way or the wrong way to look at time. The first thing that you need to do is track your time. This was a bit of a revelation for me. I've heard this before, but never really sank in until I heard how Peter Drucker described it. If you track your time, not only do you see where you're wasting time, but you'll also see who are the people in your life who waste your time. And then once you track the time, your time for a day, a week, a month, or whatever it is, you then have a clear map of where your time is going, who are the people you want to avoid, and what are the best times for you to actually do some deep work. Then he says, manage your time. And not just manage your time. He means manage the people that be taking away your time. And then finally, he talks about consolidating time. So when you're thinking about time management, just think about track, manage, consolidate. And what he means about consolidating is that are there times when you can be doing a number of tasks or a number of things that you actually see on your weekly calendar when you track yourself. And you're like, well, hold on a second. Why am I doing that on Monday and not on Friday when they're both similar tasks and will work better together? Why am I spending 20 minutes each morning on email when I could just do an hour of email on a, on a Wednesday? You know, it's about moving things around to fit better for you. So just remember, track, manage, consolidate. Even that on its own, I could end this video and you've got a life hack there or a business strategy hack that could revolutionize, revolutionize, I can't even speak today, that could change your life. Moving on to the next one is contribution. This is another uh, fantastic idea coming out of this book. And a lot of times when you read some personal development books and you read entrepreneurs talking about find your passion, this is kind of what Peter Drucker was touching on, but more in a business acts, uh, aspect and a, a little bit more what I described in a practical aspect. He was saying, wherever you are today, whatever you're doing, whether with your family, with your friends, within the workplace or your projects, in each of those areas, what's your contribution? What, what's your success statement in those areas? Like if you're in a relationship right now and you have kids, your contribution to that relationship and, that, and your family might be to be the best person possible for your family. In the place that you work right now, you might be, have a passion about a certain aspect of the job, let it be customer service or sales or marketing. So your contribution is to be the best in that area for your organization. But how many of us spend a lifetime 
not actually thinking about the contribution we want to deliver to our friends, to our family, to our work, or to our projects. Without actually clearly thinking about what we're contributing on a daily basis, we could probably let a few weeks, months, years, or a lifetime slip by. So I really find this part of the book very inspiring. And in fact, I would say it's probably the part that really stood out to me the most because I might have a success statement for my life, a general kind of, you know, fueled by passion every day, you know, with integrity and consistency, I try to bring the joy and remember to have fun. Something along those lines, I try to think about those words in each day, integrity, consistency, fun, and joy. And I try to work towards them, but I've never really taken a statement for each area of my life, whether it's with my, with my wife, with my job, or with my projects, and really spell out what I'm contributing. The next area Peter Drucker talks about is strengths. Again, this is something that I've been quite familiar with um, in my personal development journey. A lot of the really good teachers out there, from the Tony Robbins to the Dan Sullivans who run Strategic Coach, to people like Joe Polish who uh, are on I Love Marketing, Evan Pagan, other fantastic marketers, uh, success coach people and, and entrepreneurs, they very much talk about this. So when Peter Drucker brought it up, I was like, I wonder if Peter Drucker was the the, the little bit of snow at the top of the mountain, but I'm sure he heard it from somebody else and was and was focusing on it in the 60s and 70s. But focusing on your strengths are, is a fantastic tip because if you, if you build a great set of strengths, they will outshine your weaknesses. And Peter Drucker in the book does talk about the people who try to be well-rounded end up being mediocre. That struck a chord for me because I do think within some of the corporate environments I've worked in. It's about trying to create well-rounded employees and well-rounded managers and well-rounded uh, senior managers. But at the end of the day, shouldn't we just have specialists? A lot more people who are focused on a few micro things and being excellent at those and then balance those out in teams of other people who are maybe better in the other areas where that person's not so good or weak. To me, that's a better way to run an organization. And Peter Drucker was talking about that, you know, 50, 60 years ago. And modern day entrepreneurs are still bringing that up. So obviously, major corporations across the world have not learned this idea yet about focusing on strengths. I can certainly tell you the school system hasn't because when you're bad at math or English, what do they make you do? More math or English. They don't. They take you out of sports, which you might be great at, to do extra work in math and English because they think that that's important. Now, it might be because everybody needs basic math and English, but that can knock somebody's confidence by taking them out of something that they're really enjoying at the time and force them to do something that they're not. Rethinking and focusing on the strengths is to incorporate some math and English into someone's sports world. You know, try to link the two together, but not take the person out of doing sports. I mean, not to go off on a side rant there about strengths, but it is a very applicable example of where we can get things a little bit mixed up in this modern day, where we're always trying to create a well-rounded employee or well, you're trying to be well-rounded yourself, rather than actually looking at what your strengths at and then doubling down on those for a couple of years and seeing where you can go. The next one is concentration, or in the book he calls it first things first. This is the next tip out of the five. This one's pretty simple and kind of links back to the first one about managing your time. If you can manage your time, if you can track your time and you can consolidate it, then you want to make sure you're doing the right things in those time periods. Now, he talks about having big, deep areas of work. He just doesn't talk about setting out 90 minutes to do a little bit of work. He actually talks about trying to concentrate and do massive action over periods of half days, weeks, or even two weeks. So Peter Drucker was really pushing this deep work philosophy that I've heard other authors talk about recently by doing the deep work and, and creating these like windows of, of, of uh, you know, hot hours or power hours to really push the needle forward in your life and in your day. But yet Peter Drucker, 56 years ago, was saying, this is how you get things done. Half days, weeks, or two weeks, just focusing on one key driver in your life. That kind of blew me away because I'm a little bit of a dabbler. You know, I've got full-time job, got a YouTube channel, got a blog I'm trying to do. And I tend to do little 20 minute, half hour, hour here, two hours there. But yet what Peter Drucker and his experiences and his book are telling me is that I've actually got my system and my day and my weeks kind of muddled up. And I'm trying to do four or five things each day where I really should be probably selecting a day just to do one thing a day to do another thing, and maybe even a weekend to cover off other 
items on my list rather than this sort of like kaleidoscope of activities that I try to fit into one day. It's very powerful thinking and one that I'm definitely going to be investigating more. He also talks about first thing first, but I didn't quite cover there. What first thing first is, the, I think the line he used in the book is, you don't do what you want to do, you do what needs to be done. And I am 100% totally the opposite of that. I will look at my to-do list and I will look at what I want to do of that to try to clear off things that are easy or things that I want to do. And sometimes I'll push the important big action things off to the side because of some weird uh, triggers that I don't really want to do the deep work or I'm avoiding it because I'm afraid of success or whatever that is. I can tend to push off the massive action and I look for small wins to make myself feel good where Peter Drucker's basically just slapped me in the face here in the book and be like, you know what, you're doing the wrong thing here. You don't do what you want to do, you do what needs to be done. That's something that I'm really gonna try to dive deeper into and use over the coming weeks and months and throughout 2019 to really see how effective I can be by using that rule. And the last one and the last topic that we really talks about in the book kind of sums it all up and brings it uh, to a nice close is decision making. And this is the main part you would think about an effective executive. You're like, well, if you want to be effective in your life, you're going to make decisions. And actually, he quite clearly sets out in the book that the more effective you are, the actually the less decisions you should be making. An ineffective person or somebody who is being inefficient is actually making more decisions because they have to, because they haven't set what he called sort of boundary rules his ground rules or his boundary parameters of what uh, you're trying to achieve or or what your rules are for the project, for your life, or for your work. And I can see similarities in this because obviously going through a personal development journey like I have, and you can check out other videos uh, and other books that I've um, uh, discussed before in the iCard above. But the other things that I've learned so far in my journey uh, through personal development is you know, trying to have some rules and structure to your day, like having a morning routine, having an evening routine. I try not to eat past seven o'clock at night. There's certain foods are no good for me. There's certain times I don't want to be out by. And I have those parameters in my life. So when something comes along and it's a decision to be made, but it fits or it comes and it's cha- comes into my life and it's challenging a already set rule or boundary parameter in my, in my day, I don't have to make a decision because it's automatically no. I'm not gonna go out for a meal at nine o'clock at night with people because I don't eat past seven o'clock at night. I'm not going to go to bed at 12, 11 o'clock at night and sit up and watch a movie because I wanna see that movie. I'll watch it the next day because I wanna be in bed by nine o'clock because I get up at five in the morning and one of my ground rules for my life is eight hours sleep. So anything that affects that, it automatically gets a no in my life and this is what he's talking about. So you take that kind of principles and those kind of ideas and you spread them out throughout your life and throughout your day. And any time a decision comes along, it's not a decision. If it's breaking your ground rules or it's breaking your boundary uh, parameters, it's just an automatic no. There's no decision to be made there. 